I'm the executive director of the Open Textbook Initiative, which is um, an uh, initiative um, focused on uh, finding and removing barriers for faculty adoption of open textbooks. And um, we have, after learning a lot locally in Minnesota, we've reached out to other institutions and are helping them with that, with helping their faculty break down barriers to adoption. We created an open textbook library, which is an online library of uh, open textbooks so that it's easy for faculty to find them. Um, rather than having to search the web and figure out what's good and what's not. Um, we have a peer-reviewed system that we're starting to collect peer reviews on these books. Um, and then we run a workshop on the campus. It's about two hours for faculty and we uh, uh, talk to them about affordability issues in higher education, which uh, in the U.S. at least is um, huge and then also help them understand what open is and help them understand that open textbooks can be an option and a quality option many times. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we ask them to write a review of a textbook and there are two reasons for that. One is that we need reviews in the library, this online open textbook library that we can populate with reviews. But the other is that it's a great engagement strategy. It, it, they, it, it, when they leave the workshop, it's just too easy to go back to your office and get back to work and forget about what you heard. So this is a way to keep them engaged after the workshop, for them to actually take, in, they're incentivized, we pay them a couple hundred dollars and the Hewlett Foundation has funded that to date. Um, and, um, and so they, it, it helps them just engage with it and just stop and look at it. And what we find is that the combination of all of those things, the education, um, having easy to find resources in the library, and writing the review um, gains us a reasonable number of adoptions. So we started with 10 faculty in my own college, and then we just I just decided that um, I had a lot of conversations and learned a lot about the questions faculty have and the issues around open textbook adoptions, and um, just decided that there was um, it would be a waste for me to just learn this and not share this with other institutions. So that's when the Hewlett Foundation helped and that helps scale it out to these other institutions. And now there are probably way more institutions than we can do interested. I mean, there are statewide systems that are interested. Or um, So we're trying to figure out now how to scale it. And what we're hoping is we can actually leverage our partners who, have, who are um, also very knowledgeable and have learned a lot through the process. And maybe they can start running workshops and start extending it that way. We're not writing textbooks at all. You know, we are simply identifying what's out there and pulling it into this open textbook library. There are about 160 of them in there, but we didn't write any of them. They were written elsewhere. Um, we, all we're doing is putting them in one place so that it's easy for faculty to find them. Either by, they're categorized, you can search. So that's the value to that, it's the finding. So uh, we just put in whatever's out there and um, many of them are kind of low level introductory courses, you know, undergraduate courses. Uh, the library is, it, we, I did, we did build that, and we're now about to build version two, and our University of Minnesota Libraries is taking this on, and they're building a version two that'll be out in January. So instead of pointing out to all the books, which is what we do now, we don't, it's a referatory, it's not a repository, so it just refers to wherever they are on the internet, the books. We'll now be building so um, this system will come out, will be more of a repository. There'll be more of the books there, and you'll be able to get them out in, very, in different formats, and the styling will be a little nicer, and um, hopefully get some of those books in some nicer shape, better shape. Well, and, and luckily for me, I'm not developing it. Um, it's actually in our libraries. So our libraries are putting it together, and they're building it on Pressbooks, which is a WordPress plugin that's built specifically for this. Um, it was built by a company, the Pressbooks company, then, but they released it. It's an openly licensed software. Um, British Columbia, BC campus, um, has put a lot of energy into developing it. Um, Lumen Learning has, is using it as well. We've kind of settled on this single platform to serve these things up. And uh, so it's, um, there really are very few technical barriers. It isn't technically challenging. It's just really websites, you know, so. Version 2 is really just, it, it's um, going from um, what it is now, which is just a, an application we built that's very, very simple. And it points out to the books. 
to again having the books put into more of a granular structure that the, the content will actually be put in a database so you could pull it out in different formats a PDF and EPUB whatever. and and Pressbooks already does this this plugin I was talking about so it isn't like we're building this from scratch we're really building on technology that's being actively developed and used all over so but I think the you, there's clear evidence that it, we can talk about cost and talk about access to higher education and how it impacts that. But even those who are in our institutions and have a, are already here, there's evidence showing that it impacts their academic success because they are forced to make decisions about, um, they're forced to do things like not buy a textbook or to try to get by without one for as long as possible or to borrow one from a friend share one with a friend or to try to use one that's two versions old or you know all the things that they try to do or download a pirated copy of one um, and all of those kind of put themselves at some risk somehow academic risk and so um, that's really what it's all about and I think that's the message we try to give faculty is it isn't always just a, it isn't really a, I mean it is but it isn't just about money it's about the impact and the cost it's the impact of that cost Sometimes faculty won't be quite receptive to the, I, I found, the cost issue, sometimes I get the response of, well, they spend that much on beer every weekend, probably, you know. You can kind of dismiss the money, some people can. But when you say that cost has this academic, look at your students in your class. There are some students in your class who can't afford that textbook, and it's having an, an, an academic impact. They tend, that's something that's hard to ignore and hard to, they care, of course. Uh, faculty care, they do, about their students. Um, and um, that's hard to argue against. Mm -hmm. But to say, if it's free, they'll have it on day one. They're not going to wait as long as possible to buy it to see if they really need it. Um, I have two sons in college, and I know that's mm -hmm. what they do. And um, they'll have it on day number one. But all of these issues go away if the content is free. Everything, all of that goes away. The risky behavior, kind of, so. Yeah, obviously the other argument is, is in customizability and being able to, you know, license in a way that allows you to, it, basically empowering the instructor. So if you think of a faculty member, I don't remember where I heard this analogy, but the analogy was, would you rather eat somewhere where um, the food was kind of brought in and dropped down and warmed up, made somewhere else, or would you rather have, what's going to be the better experience for the, for the person eating? Or if, that, or if someone like makes food from scratch right there and so I think there is and we heard this I think at uh, we hear this at the first keynote I believe I thought this this discussion about there's evidence that's showing that when faculty are involved in their content the more deeper they're involved in it the better the learning experience is for their students so so it's easy to bring a you know commercial textbook in but if you have the opportunity to actually go through it and make it what it needs to be, really as an instructor get engaged with it, um, that, like I said, there's research showing that, there's, there's evidence showing that there's, that's, students are going to learn better. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that means it's a lot of work for faculty, and, and they need to be supported in that. Um, but if, um, if we're committed to students learning, The case is that um, um, basically that um, if besides the arguments for open, which I don't need to get into that maybe, but to say that the barriers, if, if we assume that faculty should, that, that it's a good thing for faculty to adopt open textbooks, if we assume that, then we have to recognize that there are barriers to that. It's obviously not happening widely, and there are barriers to that. And what our expertise is in is in understanding what those barriers are and have, having had a lot of discussions with a lot of faculty and a lot of administrators, we feel like we have at least some strategies to overcome that for some faculty who are willing to take the chance on it. And I feel like faculty, it's about, there's some trust there. They're trusting you, especially with the curriculum, with an open. There's, um, there has to be trust. And I think that's clear that comes with local people, people they know. 
Like, can I trust you with my textbook decision? Can I trust you with editing this? Can I, add, you know, the really important stuff. This is their academic freedom that they're uh, entrusting us with in some ways. So there was a faculty member in my session who stood up from Purdue. I didn't even know she was here, um, but I ran into her at the keynote this morning, and she um, she's from Purdue. She was in the workshop when we went to Purdue. She was a, she's an instructor, not a librarian, or she's a faculty. So she came, she wrote a review for a book, and she stood up and announced basically that um, they will be moving four of their service level math courses at Purdue University to open textbooks. And that'll be at least, you know, probably around 2,500 students per semester. That's a huge amount of money per semester students will save just on four courses. Um, so, yeah, that's. That is, that's the story people should hear. Well, I think institutions themselves have to decide what kind of support. I mean, as a CIO, um, that's what I look at every day. I have staff who help support faculty in their course development. And they're experts in technology, but also in instruction. And so make, I make those decisions all the time about what kinds of things is a support and not. And, and does every university, they all have those kinds of supports in place. The question would be, is course content development something that we want to get into? That's something I do want to get into. I mean, that's something I want my staff to get into, to helping faculty develop content. So they have a textbook, an open textbook, but it's not quite right. How do we help them make it right? And so, um, so for instance, I have a instructional designer. I have instructional designers on my staff. So those are the kinds of people who could work with a faculty member to say, all right, what do you want to do with this? Let's make sure that it's pedagogically sound, that it makes sense with your syllabus, and it makes sense with your assessments. And it's, you know, it's like designing an online course. It's the same kinds of things. It's best when you partner with instructional designer. It's just that you're taking. So instead of putting the content on the web, putting in a course management system, you're now taking this content and putting it in a book or in a whatever, a learning object or whatever you want to call it. It's best when you're working with an instructional designer. So and I think institutions have to kind of face that. I mean, try to decide, OK, in this, if this stuff is going to be out there, this open, and we're encouraging it, then I think it's the institution's responsibility is to say, we're also going to support your making this stuff what you need it to be. I, I mean, I think it, depending on the institution, it could exist in a number of places. But the important thing, and this has nothing to do with maybe what works for faculty better, uh, even ignoring that for a minute, my dean has her own strategic initiatives. Open is one of them. I mean, she thinks this is important, and she's been supporting me in that. Um, you know, I have a full-time job, but I'm doing this as well. And she's been very supportive because she thinks it's the right thing to do, and it makes the college look good, and it, you know. Um, I'm not sure I would get that support if I went up anybody. So, and she has other strategic, so my job is to help her meet her strategic directions and needs for this college. Every college has different things that are, are important to them. So for that purpose alone, having these local services in the colleges is important because it allows local priorities to be met. And like I said, in mine, open is one. That doesn't mean that you know there can't be there are university units, and we have university kind of academic technology support, you know, at the university level too that do good things, um, and they are more focused on university priorities, which is okay. I mean, so it could be both. It could be either, um, but it, it's more about like whose priorities are you trying to meet. Um, I also believe that people locally, like like me in the colleges, we have very close relationships with faculty compared to our central IT people. Um, it's just because we live with them and you know we work with them every day and we help them with their problems directly. Um, it isn't the central IT people to me, seem to be more focused on infrastructure, you know the tools that we use. Um, but it's a little harder to gain a relationship. Good question. You know, I think it could go either right I'm in the col one of the colleges. The College of Education and Human Development. So there's, you know, College of Science and Engineering, College of Liberal Arts, College of Biological Sciences, and so on. We're the College of Education and Human Development. And that's where my PhD is from. It's from uh, 
in learning tech learning technologies. Um, I am the CIO of that college. There's also a CIO of the university, right? So um, I am technically in the IT group. However, we're, I think as central IT does more and more of the kind of desktop support, and they're the ones hosting our servers now, and they're doing more of that, I don't know how else to put it, but mundane IT services. It does free us up to do the important work. I mean, not that that's not important, but that's not why we're here. The, the work, the mission critical work of actually working with faculty, helping them do their work better, their research and their teaching and, and uh, outreach. I mean, well, who are really partnering with our other institutions, right? So I'll go to, say, the University of Oklahoma, and we're partnering, in that case, with the libraries there. And they have someone whose full-time job it is, frankly, actually, to be like an open librarian to work with the, fa the faculty. So all we're really doing is providing her, perhaps, with some knowledge. In this case, not a lot. She's very knowledgeable. Um, it always helps to have an outside person come in and talk about something. So even if I even if she knows more than I do about open, uh, just to have someone on the outside because you know how that goes. I mean, it's just um, an outside expert is always more credible than someone internal. Um, but it uh, it works very well because really what we're just doing is helping support their local initiative. They if they're bringing us to campus because they want to do something, we're giving them something to do that we say we're pretty sure you'll get some adoptions when we're all done. And then um, I actually, and then after the workshops, I will collect data from the faculty about their knowledge before and after the workshop and their intent. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to have you decided to adopt or not? And I'll push that back to the institution so they know what's going on. They can go talk to those faculty and help support them. Um, so I'm not really working directly with faculty. And, and the content barrier, I mean, between content areas doesn't really matter much because they don't listen to me um, for expertise in content. You know, I'm not going to go to them and say, this is a really great physics book. I'm not, well, I actually did teach physics for many years, but maybe that's a bad example. This is a really great biology book. I have no idea. It isn't my, I, uh, they would instantly question me, like, how do you, you know, who are you? So I stay out of the quality discussion. All I do is say there's a need and there's a, and there's a source, you know, go find them. So, and I let them have decide for themselves what the quality is. Well, at my presentation, you know, I actually had some of my partners stand up, three different institutions, people that we worked with, and talk about for a you know really short time um, the impact that it's had on them. And it it it, it means, for, you know, their faculty adopted, so they got adoptions out of it in their institution, which which means it's saving students money and and impacting academic success then, right? Um, it also um, bringing us in and as a project, as kind of like, here's a project we're going to tap into, helps them with credibility at the institution. Instead of just going to their boss and saying, we want to do something about open. The boss might kind of go, well, you know, but to say, here's someone who will come to our campus for nothing or for very little money because of the Hewlett grant. And we just want to tap into this. There's credibility there, especially since I come from um, a research one institution. And so it gives people on the ground who want to do this work some ability to do something and get the permission to do it, which then, when successful, is much easier to get. You know, Once they start seeing some success, they can start bragging about it to the provost or to the whatever and start and, and, and then internally maybe build more of a sustainable program. Well, and I haven't reached out to anybody, actually. They've all reached out to me. I haven't sold this at all, um, and it's all been word of mouth, and because I've talked a little bit about what happened at Minnesota and what we did. And so um, the interest has all been very organic, and it has almost always been libraries. It really has. And um, um, not always. Sometimes it's been the IT side or the Center for Teaching and Learning kind of people, but almost always it's librarians, which makes sense. I mean, their their mission in life is to make information accessible to the world. So you know, doesn't get any better than that. Yeah.